welcome. You'll see my garden in the background here. And the first thing I want to do is give you a little tour of the garden. I love having guests. I love having visitors in my garden. And while I can't have all of you here in person, I'd like to give you a little taste of it virtually. So um, I live in Santa Monica, as Christine said, and I'm in a townhouse um, which has no land, but um, some patio and porch space. And it measures about 150 square feet in total. The biggest part's the back patio, and um, which is 140 square feet. And then I have a little front porch as well. And in that space, I have over 200 plants and they are all in containers um, since there is no land. About two thirds of the plants are California natives um, and the rest are some other kinds that I'll mention as well. I am not a purist necessarily with respect to natives, but I do think the majority of the garden ideally is native um, for a number of reasons. I think it's enjoyable, they're beautiful plants, they're meant to live here and you have the wildlife benefits and so on. So um, as I said, it's about two thirds California natives. And then in addition to the container garden um, or the plants in containers, I also have a small um, bootstrap kind of home nursery that yielded about 200 plants um, a couple of years ago. And uh, the last year's crop was 400 plants. And that is mostly for some personal projects, which I'll also talk about. And I also grow plants for friends and neighbors. And last thing I'll mention before um, moving forward is that this space became a certified wildlife habitat in 2021. And I will talk a bit more about what that means as well. So this is just to orient you to the scope of the space and where we are. So um, 200 plus plants, right now it's about 250 something in 150 square feet. How does that happen? And the first thing, just very simply, I just, I wanted a garden. Um, I just really wanted plants. I wanted a lovely garden. And especially, I started learning about, um, a lot more about California native plants in 2019, so about four years ago. And I was just falling in love with our native plants and their beauty, their aroma, the way that they um, structure and are part of the environment. And I really wanted some of them in my own garden. But when I started looking at that, one thing I was hearing a lot from uh, people in the native plant community, not everybody, but a lot of people was quote, native plants belong in the ground. And I understand why that's true for something like a spruce live oak or a valley oak or an Engelman oak, where you've got those big trees and deep tap roots, but the kind of blanket statement of native plants belong on the ground, um, it sat with me a little funny, honestly, because if native plants have to go in the ground, that means you have to have ground or land to have native plants. And to have land, it means you have privilege. And so therefore what that statement is essentially saying is that you have to have privilege in order to have native plants. And that just sat wrong with me, honestly. Um, I didn't know much about plants, but it just felt like morally, universally, ethically, that just couldn't be right. And so I thought, let's see what I can prove. Because I, I don't, I don't, there's got to be a way, right? And so, as you can see here, I mean, part of what I set out to prove is that people can be part of the natural world, even in an urban setting, without land and without bags of money. I wanted to do this in a way that was accessible because I think, um, and I imagine many of the people on this call feel the same way, that people have a responsibility to be good stewards of the natural world, but it's also in a way our birthright and our privilege. Like we are meant to be connected with the natural world. We are healthiest, most whole when we are. And so I want to prove that. Um, and speaking of accessibility, I wanted to do it in a way that was as affordable as I could figure out. And so, as I mentioned, I have about 250 plants and most of them were free. And 
honestly, I love saying that. And I'm really proud of that because I feel it's a testament to the community and the various forms of community that made that possible. So um, of the 250 plants or so, I paid actual cash money for nine of them. And the rest of them I got through other means I've described here. Many of them, I'd say the majority, I grew from seeds and from cuttings, whether I bought the seeds or got cuttings from friends' gardens. Um, and of course, making sure that everything is ethically sourced. Um, so that was an area where propagation skills and volunteering in native plant nurseries and experimenting with that um, was really foundational to creating this garden. Um, I also had some plants that were gifted by like-minded friends, friends who understood what I was trying to accomplish, um, who loved native plants and understood what might make sense in an environment like this. And I want to linger on these first two points for a bit, um, propagating plants and gifted plants, because between what I grew from seeds that were gifted by friends, from cuttings that were gifted by friends, um, a handful of plants that were gifted by friends as well, um, things that I learned from friends and from people in the native plant community, I look around my garden and I see over 20 people represented in that space who all gave to the garden in some way. And I love that, I think it's a testament to community and what happens when people come together um, to make the world a little bit better. And then a couple of other ways that I got plants. Um, in some places, they're considered weeds, um, whether it's a sidewalk median or um, in some cases, I mentioned that I volunteered at some native plant nurseries. And some of them would have volunteers popping up um, through you know, the, the gravel, the ground cover. And while they're natives and they're wonderful, in a nursery setting, you really need to have kind of just the plants that you're trying to propagate there to be sort of focused and sanitary and all of that. So I there were a couple of days where I volunteered in the plant nursery and I pulled every weed out of the ground. And some of them were real weeds like euphorbia, but a lot of them were things like monkey flower or willow herb inside. Took them home, popped them in some soil, um, crossed my fingers, and amazingly, a lot of them survived. And then the last way I got plants was um, a lot of them volunteered. So it's funny because I would have thought of a container garden as being very controlled and contained. But one thing I've learned through this process, and I'll speak to a bit more later on as well, is just even a container garden can spiral wildly out of control. And it is really fun. Um, really fun to uh, see that happen. Um, right, I just noticed in the chat, there were some audio issues, but it sounds like everything is okay now. Please pipe up if it's not. Okay. So um, next thing I'll do is I'll talk a bit about how the garden is arranged. So, one thing, I've lived most of my adult life in small spaces, and one thing I learned starting in my very first college dorm room is that if you don't keep a small space highly organized, it just devolves into squalor very quickly. So um, even in a small space, I like to keep things organized, and it's also honestly just a little bit of a reflection of my personality. Um, and so my garden, I have it divided into five categories. So you'll see them laid out here. Um, Aromatherapy, uh, which are, you know, aromatic plants, um, sages and sagebrush and such, um, coastal and chaparral plants, um, and really aromatherapy is kind of a subset of the coastal sage scrub, but I'll go into more detail on that in a bit. Um, a nursery where I propagate mostly native plants, also some um, edible and medicinal and kind of personally significant plants. I have a kitchen section that has food plants, um, chili peppers and tomatoes and onions and such. And finally, succulents like jade, echeveria, uh, kind of classic drought tolerant um, plants that do well as house plants or outdoors, what have you. And I will go into more detail on the first three of these sections, but I will not on kitchen and succulents later. So I'll just talk about them a little bit here because again, I think there's some themes of community and connection that comes with them. So 
In uh, my kitchen section, I have found with food plants, and some people are really good at them. I'm not all that sure that I am, honestly. <laughs> and I don't know why, but for some reason, for me, they seem to require a lot of water, a lot of inputs. Um, and so for that reason, because they're somewhat resource, resource intensive for me, I try to focus on food plants that I can't get at the grocery store. So the peppers that we see pictured here um, is Capiscum annuum buena mulata, the buena mulata chili peppers. And they have a really interesting history. So around the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, there were a couple of thriving black catering communities communities in Baltimore and Philadelphia. And one of the things that they did was they um, one of the things that they did was uh, they propagated a lot of their own chili peppers and other vegetables for use in their cuisine. And um, so these are just kind of heirloom heritage peppers. And then over time they were lost to history for a little while, but in, um, I believe it was the 50s or the, um, excuse me, there about, uh, one of the grandchildren of um, the folks in these catering communities, he was in his grandfather's basement, and he found a drawer um, full of packets of seeds of all kinds with all kinds of labels. And one of the, one of the packets was labeled Juana Mulata and Pippin. And it turns out that these chili peppers were part of kind of that group of heirloom vegetables that um, those catering communities uh, propagated and used. And Horace Pippin, the famous African-American painter, these were actually his favorite chili peppers. And I mean, besides the flavor, you can also see why from these gorgeous colors, they start purple, then they turn orange, and then finally red, and they're edible at every stage. So you can imagine how much like a painter's eye would appreciate that. So he would use seeds from these plants as payment um, within the community. And so they come with this incredibly rich um, history. I was gifted some seeds from a friend of my own Twitter, started propagating these. And meanwhile, um, I ended up connecting on Instagram with a community garden in South Central LA. And I found out that one of the things that they're trying to do is focus on um, African and African American ancestral foods in that garden. And when I heard that, I was like, oh my gosh, I have some ancestral foods growing right here in my garden. And so I've been able to mail them seeds and do these exchanges. And so I think it just goes to show how plants can really create community in unexpected and powerful ways. And then speaking of community, um, succulents. So I love, um, I love these little guys. Um, they are easy, kind, forgiving. And um, I so often have friends and neighbors who say, oh, I love your garden. I wish I could start a garden, but I can't. I have a brown thumb. And I'm like, no, 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 I, I really, I believe you've got this here. Just like take a little jade in a pot or something like that. And like knowing that honestly, these are very easy and forgiving plants, but it's such a good way to get people started on plants because they are beautiful, they're easy, they're forgiving, and they get people confident with their ability to plant for plants and get excited about it. So I kind of think of them as a gateway plant. Okay. So, all right. So we are going to talk first about the aromatherapy um, section. So I as I mentioned, I live in a small space. I'm about a mile and a half from the coast. So there is a marine layer effect here just about every morning. And because it's such a tight space, I wanted to pack in as many aromatic and fragrant plants as I could think of to um, get that effect. And so you'll see some of them pictured here. Um, this is very confusing. It is a sagebrush and a verbena lilacina delamina um, that are sitting right next to each other. So it looks like one combined plant. Um, we've got a hummingbird sage here. I've actually got eight of them throughout the garden. Um, and then this is a uh, um, La Pichinia fragrance, fragrant pitcher sage. So 
Uh, and it's just one of my favorite things in life to step out onto my patio at six in the morning and breathe in the fragrance because it's really held in by that rain layer. And it's just the best way to start the day. Um, and actually, and I will make a little detour to talk about where these plants came from, just because I think it's a good representation of how many ways it came through. So the sagebrush um, I got from a native plant nursery that I was volunteering at. The verbena, I won as a prize for a costume contest um, at a native plant nursery. This hummingbird sage, I propagated from a cutting from a friend's garden. And this fragrant picture sage is one of the nine that bought, I bought. This came from um, Theodore Pippen. So it kind of gives you an idea of the different avenues that um, plants can come through. And as I pop that, I'm like, okay, oh, yeah, that's three plants free, one plant purchased. That's pretty close to representative of how I source the plants. Um, there we go. So those aromatherapy plants that I talked about, um, a lot of them are uh, really a subset of the coastal sage scrub community. It figures, you know, whether it's the sages, I also have purple sage in there, some other things, um, and chaparral plants as well. And I started with coastal sage scrub and chaparral plants because honestly, these were the first plants that I learned about when I was learning about native plants. So that's just what I moved forward with. And it just goes to show sometimes it is better to be lucky than good because I think choosing plants like this from these communities was my saving grace because I made so many mistakes. I'm sure I'm still making mistakes, but I made just a ton of mistakes that first year. And these plants are so tough and so hardy and they forgave the mistakes and survive. And so one of the things that I think about, I would say the one of the biggest mistakes was that I didn't know that native plants in containers do need some food, some form of fertilizer or amendment or something. Um, because I had heard native plants, they don't need fertilizer. And that is true in the ground because they're in their native habitat. But in, um, in containers, it's a different matter because they're not in the ground. So the ground's not being replenished in the way that normally is. And with watering a container, the nutrients do eventually leach out. And so the first, gosh, eight to 10 months I had this garden, I um, didn't feed the plants anything. And then on top of that, I had not even used fresh potting soil because as I mentioned, I was trying to save money and make this as accessible as possible. So I was scavenging spent soil from nurseries, other people's container gardens, um, some leftover stuff I had. And so I put these poor plants in spent soil and it didn't feed them for eight to 10 months. And yet, every single one survived. And then when I got the memo and I started feeding them a little bit, um, they don't need a lot of food, just a couple times a year. I give natural things like coffee grounds and wood castings and things like that. Oh my gosh, once we got over that hump, they just really started to thrive. So um, I would say like when people ask me how to start a container garden, I think the first thing that comes out of my mouth every time is, choose plants that are easy and forgiving because um, it's just, it's such a blessing to receive that forgiveness because there will be mistakes and it's okay and it happens, but um, these plants forgave me. And so like, for example, here we have, um, I guess some chaparral plants, um, various dudleyas, dudleya virensis species tassii, actually that's more coastal, that's an island dudleya, dudleya densiflora, sagebrush, dendromicon rigida, the chaparral bush poppy, um, I like to create little subsections within uh, my garden. So this right here is what I call the seaside section. Um, so in terms of mistakes or learnings, another thing I realized, I've had three plants die prematurely in my garden and all three were desert plants. And every one of them, like it's like an abudlon pulmeri and things like that, desert mallow. Um, Every one of them held on for a year or two, but just never really thrived and eventually gave up. And 
And it was funny because I only really realized this some months ago. I was, I was thinking through the plants that hadn't made it. And I was like, wait, every one of them was a desert plant. And I think even though I adjusted the soil, even though I was watering less, there's that marine layer that I was talking about. It was just too much for them to take. Um, and so that was another like learning for me. It's like, wow, lean into the local climate. And so it's inversely, then I realized that the plants that have absolutely just glowed up with zero help really on my part, it seems, are the plants that have more like sea or coastal or ocean or island in their names. Um, and so this is what I call the seaside section. So we've got a seaside daisy, a sea cliff buckwheat, a big sur manzanita, which you see a close up of over here, um, and a couple of Armeria maritima, um, the common name is a uh, thrift sea pink. And so those are just like easy peasy. And so I think that's like another tip I give to people who are looking to start uh, their own garden is find out the plants that do well everywhere because um, they are tough and hardy like sagebrush. Um, and find the plants that do really well in your local environment and lean into that. And I guess the last thing I would say on this is kind of part of the joy of using plants that are really suited to your local environment is that they're happy and they're just really obviously happy and it just makes you happy. Like that was another reason I was, I mean, I wanted to group the plants together here, the seaside plants, because in my head, I think they like being together because they like being together in nature. But also I just, I see how happy they are and it makes me happy too. Um, just, it's tangible. They're living their best life and who doesn't want to be around someone or something that's living their best life. Sorry, I lost my mouse there for a second. Here we go. So um, my little nursery. So you're looking at it right there on the left-hand side. Um, it doesn't look like much. It is a couple of tables. It is amazing how many plants you can grow in a really small space. So um, what we are looking at right there are two trays of three inch pots. So that is almost a hundred plants that we're looking at those grasses there. Um, those grasses are stipopulca or purple needle grass. And um, of the 200 and 400 plants that I mentioned earlier, um, most of them are stipopulcra, and they, th these are all intended for a little mini grassland restoration project that um, I started up at my mom's home or my parents' home in Northern California. So my mom is an amazing gardener, the most amazing gardener I know, and she has a couple of acres of what used to be bare land that was covered with wild oats and mustard, and she took half of it and turned it into just gorgeous garden. Um, she does love ornamentals. There are roses and hydrangeas. There's also a more drought tolerant Mediterranean things like lavender and rosemary, and it's just stunning. Um, and then the other half is mostly on this very steep hillside that's just impossible to irrigate in any way. And so landscaping, it didn't really seem like an option. Um, she tried throwing California poppy seeds on that hillside for, in her words, I mean, years, and is convinced, and I believe her, that she threw millions of poppy seeds onto that hillside, and nothing, nothing ever grew. Um, go ahead and pause a moment and let those sirens pass by in the background. As I mentioned, I live in a very urban environment. Um, yeah, so she threw millions of poppies on that hillside for years and years, and nothing ever bloomed. And then four years ago, I started getting interested in native plants. I started learning about plants that are beautiful, even when they're not irrigated. And I'm like, oh, maybe we can do something here. And I, I'm reading a lot, I'm doing a lot of research. And I ended up learning that wild oats in particular, Avena fatua, they inhibit poppy seed germination and growth. And so all those seeds that my mom had been throwing on that hillside all the time, they were just not being allowed to sprout by all the wild oats that were on that hillside. And then I read that something like Stipopulcra can compete really effectively against wild oats. 
but ideally if it's given a head start in a nursery. So if you're just broadcasting seeds, a type of pumpkin seeds onto a hillside that has a bunch of wild oats on it already, the seeds might germinate, but the plants won't survive because they'll be shaded out by the wild oats. So it's better to give them a head start in a nursery six months in advance so they've got some height on them. So when you plant them out from October, November, December, they can see the sun and they can grow. So I kicked it off with a hundred type of pulchra in uh, 2021, planted them out. And um, the middle picture here is May of 2022. Yes, I got the years right. And what you are looking at are the first poppies that have bloomed on this hillside in over 40 years. And given the history of colonization, maybe over a century. Um, so we saw the purple needle grass thriving. We sowed some extra poppy seeds to be sure. Um, those little orange dots that you see kind of scattered throughout the uh, middle picture. Some of them we sowed last season. Some of them I think are probably the old seeds that my mom threw out however long ago. And so we got really excited, decided to grow a lot more. I grew another, gosh, close to 400 or so last season. Turned out to be too many for the space. So I ended up donating a flat to um, some other folks who are doing good work. And then we planted the remainders. So what you see in the right hand picture is a proportion of the now 368 purple needle grass that are in the ground. Um, and so it's kind of, it's a mini restoration project. And I was just, there a few weeks ago, and I noticed a lot, along with these, a lot of Stipopulchra volunteers coming up from seeds that were um, came off the plants last season, and little poppy sprouts next to them. Um, I probably should have included a picture, but I even noticed the pattern what it seemed like. I would find one Stipopulchra and one poppy seedling right next to each other, like they just seem to come in pairs. So I don't know if they're helping each other or what, but anyway, this is kind of a grassland project that I had in mind, it'll also obviously help with erosion control and things like that, but I think it goes to show you can do a lot in a small space and with not a ton of money. I calculated, by now I'm using good potting soil, but once I factored in all the seed costs, um, potting soil costs, things like that, the plants ended up costing me about 11 cents each. So um, yeah, it gives you an idea of um, what you can accomplish. Um, a little bit of a propagation and a um, little bit of bullheadedness, I guess. So I've talked about the sections um, and I've talked about people community. I also wanna talk about wildlife community. So I um, mentioned this is a certified wildlife habitat and to be a certified wildlife habitat is the National Wildlife Federation that does a certification. They have five criteria. So they require three sources of food, one source of water, a um, shelter for um, animals to take refuge from the elements or from predators, places for animals to mate and raise their young, and sustainable practices um, in terms of, say, fertilizer uses pe pesticides and so on, or preferably the lack thereof. And um, it's funny because I started out wanting plants and I was adding plants and I noticed like the wildlife traffic on my patio was just starting to increase. And I should take a step back and say like, a lot of this was learning just step by step. And so I just would put out, you know, four or five plants at a time. And then I'd see more birds, more butterflies, more bugs of kinds I'd never seen before. And then I even started seeing native plants that I didn't plant. So um, I have an enormous black sage now in my garden that I did not plant and I did not propagate. Um, so I think maybe some birds donated it. I don't know. Um, I've seen tomcat clover, miner's lettuce, and I do love kind of the idea that I planted these plants in part to be food for wildlife. And then in turn, they brought things like miner's lettuce that I can eat. So it's like we're feeding each other. Um, and I mean, I. I live a bit too close to the coast to be putting in milkweed plants, but I have nectarine plants. And um, I started seeing monarch butterflies um, two years ago. I've lived here over 15 years and it was the first time I'd ever seen monarch butterflies. And, and it's just amazing to me because it's like, gosh, we're in an urban environment. You guys might be able to hear all the sirens passing me in the background. Um, it's 
like there's buildings and cement and concrete. How, how did you guys find this? And I'm so glad you did. And I just, I marvel at that. And um, some other bugs that found their way in were aphids. And um, they were a problem at the start, especially when I had some new plants um, because they love all that new growth. Um, but I felt really strong that I didn't want to use pesticides. Um, obviously there's a wildlife ha habitat certification, but more importantly, I know the effect that they have on the environment and um, up the food chain. And I, just, I adamantly did not want to use pesticides of any kind. And so the first few months were a little gross. Honestly, I think aphids are almost as gross as ticks, but um, then I just started seeing hoverflies and ladybugs showing up. You'll see a hoverfly um, hanging out in that poppy there. And aphids aren't a problem anymore. It's um, the hoverflies and the ladybugs manage them. and do the work for me. And I was also realizing, I think, because this was in a small space, because it's in my home and my space, that as the wildlife was coming through and I am here I was noticing patterns. And I realized that birds, they follow routines. They're they're like people and they're like dogs and they love their routines too. And so like I, um, there's an Anna's hummingbird that first season, she'd come through at 8.30 and 4.30 every day. A little dark-eyed junko would come talking to you at 2 p.m. And it just, there's a different kind of intimacy, I think, when you're realizing, gosh, they have their way of living their lives too. And here we are kind of intersecting and connecting with each other. And then on top of stopping by for food, they started nesting in the garden. So I had a morning dove pair nesting on the roof. Um, found the hashed eggshell that they had tossed over into the garden um, when their baby was born. They do that to keep the nest clean and keep predators from picking up on the scent. And then I've also had um, an Allen's hummingbird. So two years ago in 2021, an Allen's hummingbird built a little nest on my front porch and had a couple of babies. And then and my front porch, I have six big camellias on there um, and it's pretty sheltered. And then it wasn't used in 2022, but this spring I saw little Aunt Alan's hummingbird come back one day while I was out there and just come zooming straight into the nest. And I was like, oh my gosh, she, she knew exactly where to find that nest. But it's interesting because I was like, well, maybe that's the original mother who built the nest. But then I noticed this one, she was just like a little bit more shy of me. Her personality is a little different. So I think she might actually be one of the babies who was born in the garden in 2021. And then she came back to have her own young. So um, that's her sitting right there warming her eggs. And then this um, these are her two eggs in the little nest. Um, I took that on February 19th, and that's the last time I've been on my front porch because it is now her home, and um, I just hang out nearby. I'm just a neighbor, so um, as far as I'm concerned, that is her territory. That is her space, and I just, I love being able to see the natural world this close and look at something like just how beautifully that nest is constructed and how lush and soft and gorgeous, and I just, and I could just go on and on. There's just never a dull moment here. And I'm a block north of Wilshire, but um, it just feels like it's vibrant with wildlife. Another thing, um, it serves wildlife. And I found this garden serves me in so many ways too. And I have found that it's a place of contemplation for me. So um, Christine mentioned I'm a writer um, and I draw a lot of inspiration here. I wrote most of my first collection inside this garden. And um, what, I, what I want to share with you here is just kind of one of the plants and one of the trains of thought that it inspired, but this is happening with all the plants all the time. So I'm just giving an idea. What we're looking at here is um, the, a hummingbird sage, obviously. Um, and it is the first plant that I ever propagated from a cutting. So you'll see here when it was just starting out and I was propping it. And I think if you've seen hummingbird stage growing, it's, you know, very like kind of loosey-goosey and loud and a little wonky. Um, 
And then I saw this cutting glowing. I was like, what are you doing? Because she was growing in this just perfectly organized spiral pattern. Um, it makes me think of origami paper folds or the structure of haiku or something like that. I was like, you're just so orderly and elegant and beautiful and facing these leaves in this really unusual and exceptional way. So it was just fun watching her glow. And then she shot up her first flower stalk, which you see in the middle picture here. And I was so excited. Um, but one of the things that I learned in a horticultural class with Antonio Sanchez, who is a um, Mantra Sierra Vista nursery manager. So he um, thought that with hummingbird sage, with that first flower stalk, you want to cut it off so that the, flower, the plant keeps growing and spreading. Because if you leave that flower stalk alone and it blooms, it goes to seed, its job is done, right? It's reproduced itself. So then it'll just die back and it'll stop growing. Uh, but if you cut the flower off, then it thinks, oh, I still have a job to do. So it keeps growing and spreading. And so I learned that. I was like, oh, this is scary, but okay, I'll do it. Um, and I did. And it worked. And so then in the third picture here, you'll see there is, um, I use my mouse to point. So there is kind of that original plant stalk right there. And then she put out four rhizomes almost symmetrically because that's apparently just her whole personality and um, started sending out, you know, these beautiful stalks of plants here. With more plants. So of course I'm thrilled to see this plant growing, but Meanwhile, I noticed that um, this kind of central stalk, I'm like, it's kind of turning yellow and red. It's not looking so good. And I was like, oh my gosh, is it dying? So I take a picture of her. I, I volunteer at the RS3 nursery. So I show up one day with a photo of the plant and I'm just like, here's a picture, is my plant dying? And Antonio says, first of all, the plant, it's not just that center stalk, like she is all for of these rhizomes as well, because um, she's spreading, she's spreading, right? This is all one plant. It's like, there's a creosote bush in I think the Mojave Desert um, called King Clone that they think is about 10, 11,000 years old. And it is a gigantic ring-shaped plant that just started as a little stalk and kept spreading by rhizome. And then the center stalk would die back like this, but it would just keep spreading. So he was like, you know, your plant is not dying. She's spreading. Sometimes that's what happens is the center will be dormant as the outside spreads. I'm like, okay, okay, good. The plant's not dying. And then I go home and I'm looking at the plant. I'm thinking about this. I'm like, why do I still feel this sense of loss? that this original part of her that was just so beautiful and unusual um, and startlingly gorgeous, that's going away. Why do I still feel this sense of loss even though my plant is perfectly fine and she's, she's perfectly healthy and growing? And it made me reflect on those times in our lives, and I think we all have them, when we need to give up something good in our lives, um, not something bad, like not something bad or self-destructive or toxic, because those are just things we should give up anyway, but sometimes you have something good and beautiful and lovely and something that feels even perfect in your life, but then the time comes when you need to let it go so that you can grow and you can spread and be even more beautiful. And in this case, um, less, more hummingbirds. So and it just, it made me think about that. And um, you know, what, what it means to give up things in our lives that are good, knowing that we're moving on to what is better and what is best. So as a coda to that, I want to show what this hummingbird sage looks like a little bit later, seven months later. So this was in December. Um, I fertilized the garden with coffee grounds, cinnamon, worm castings, it's the pumpkin spice latte mix. It smells really good. I, 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 that, that's a, sorry, that's probably a silly joke. Don't actually use pumpkin spice latte mix. It just smells like pumpkin spice latte. Um, so yeah, I, 
type of plant back, trust that she would grow. And oh my goodness, did she ever. And then when I talk about kind of needing to give up something good to become something better and have more an effect, um, I want to show you kind of this plant's impact 10 months later. So the uh, Alan's hummingbird that I mentioned earlier, her babies were born on March 9th now on my front porch. And you can see her feeding um, the babies here. And for moments before I got this video, I saw the mom feeding on the hummingbird stage in the back. And so she is literally regurgitating the nectar of that specific hummingbird stage into her baby's um, throats and feeding them here. And I just, I feel so lucky to be able to see this. Um, as I said, she's on my front porch. It is her space. I have set up a um, ladder in right by the front window of my living room. And I just sit on the ladder and I watch her and she sees me there. She doesn't care. Um, and she's, I, I learned as I was researching more about how um, mother hummingbirds be their young and so that apparently it's very unusual to ever get to see this in person because um, they usually hide their nests really well. They don't nest near people. They don't want to be their young when people are around. And yet I've got a front row seat because of this little container garden. And I just feel so privileged and um, rich, so wealthy in being able to see this. So. Um, yeah, they're just, they're very cute and they're very hungry. And I see her in my patio garden a lot. And I'm so glad that it's easy for her to get food. Um, one of the questions that has come up from time to time um, when others have seen this, they're like, oh, why wouldn't she nest in a food plant or closer to it? And I looked it up and apparently hummingbirds, they don't nest in food plants. And I thought about it, I'm like, it makes sense. I mean, who would want to raise a baby in a restaurant, right? So. Um, she just she just lives near a restaurant um, instead of in the restaurant. And finally, the last thing um, I think I shouldn't say the last thing, but I think another big area in which this garden has given to me um, is my past and my ancestry. And so, really, this garden has become a connection to my past. So. I am Korean American. I was born in this country. My parents immigrated here. Um, and as often happens with such families, I didn't get to see much of my grandparents when I was little because they were living in Korea. Um, you see my maternal grandparents pictured here. And I mean, I love them. I know they love me, but I just didn't get to see them much when we died when I was young. And this has always been kind of part of my past that I would have liked to have been more connected to. And last spring, uh, my mom and I were talking about my container garden. And she said, you know, your grandfather had a container garden in our apartment in Seoul, um, which was a really big deal because, I mean, they had survived Japanese colonialism and a world war and a Korean war. And um, they're just really hard times in the country in the post-war era. And gardening was not really something that most people did or thought about. Times were just really hard. Um, but my grandfather loved plants so much that even that tiny little apartment space in Seoul, he wanted to have plants living there with him. And then as she's telling me this, I realized that in like my favorite photos of my uh, maternal grandparents, as you see here, that there are always plants in the background. So. Yeah, I mean, you see the planters laid out here, the little plot sitting behind my grandmother in the lower left picture. And, and I went back and I looked at these photos and, and it's funny because I, I never saw this garden, but it feels so familiar, it hurts. And I am just so grateful that I saw this and I look at my garden now and I just, I feel so connected to my grandparents um, when I'm there because I'm thinking I'm doing the same thing that they did. I looked at a space where some 
people thought it might be hard to have plants have a natural world living there and found a way anyway, because um, that's what we were meant to do. So I am grateful for that connection um, to the past as well. And then lastly, and then I'll go through questions, just to recap, I think, um, I think about the lessons that my garden has taught me, and this is the best that I can summarize them at this time, although it continues to teach me, and this may look totally different a year from now, but I just found that even the littlest garden can support an abundance of life. I mean, I've spoken at length about this, about uh, how vibrant the environment is, um, the plant life itself, the wildlife it supports, um, the reflections on my life and my past and my family and things like that, that it supports life in so many different forms and ways. Um, it surprises me every day. And you think, oh, little garden, like how surprising can that be? It is surprising every day. I see plants doing something I hadn't expected. Um, that funny little hummingbird, just one example. Um, I, I mean, the day that I was looking at the light hitting my Channel Island Dudleya, um, is it Channel Island or Cadley Island? I am not good with common names. I'm sorry. The Dudleya variance of species has the eye. And I saw the light hit it in a certain way where the Dudley leaves, they just glowed up almost like lamps. And that was the first time I realized that Dudleyas could be translucent. Um, some seed that had been kind of sitting in the nursery tray for more than four weeks. And I was wondering if it was ever going to make it. And I see the cotyledons start to pop up. So there's always a surprise and it's always delightful. Um, it's taught me about the natural world and my place in it and our place in it. I think what I think we should all have a chance to have. And I, I keep using the phrase, the natural world very intentionally because in American English, at least, we often use the word nature like, I love nature. I love spending time in nature. I want to help nature. And as loving and well-intentioned as those phrases are, they make nature an other. It makes nature something outside of ourselves. Um, but in indigenous languages in California and around the world, really, um, many of these language, they, languages, they don't have such a word that they use in that way because we are all part of the natural world, people and plants and animals. We are all connected and we are all part of kind of one living whole being. And, um, and it's funny because I think Sometimes it's easy to feel like, well, I've got to like drive a couple of hours into the mountains or drive 15 minutes to the beach to get into nature. Um, you don't have to go anywhere. And people shouldn't have to go anywhere. Um, and as much as we can find ways to bring the natural world into our home, and for me personally, um, a passion of mine is to find ways to help others to do that in their environment. I think the more whole and feel we are as people and as a community. Um, I've found the garden, it can bounce back from our mistakes. So um, I've talked about my mistakes, my non-fertilizer mistakes, my desert plants and ocean environment mistakes, um, plenty of other mistakes as well. And I think it's funny because when I talk to people who are like maybe thinking about starting a garden, they're like, oh, I'm worried I might mess something up or what's the right way to do it? Or is there like a recipe or one, two, three? And first of all, there's no recipe, but I think I'm like, you know what, if you want to do this, just try it because you are going to make mistakes. Like if you try anything worthwhile in life, you will make mistakes, but you can learn from those mistakes and do better and figure things out, do research, um, tell other people your mistakes so hopefully they don't have to make the same ones. Um, so yeah, the garden can bounce back. And I mean, maybe some plants won't bounce back and that is what it is, but we, we as people, we can always bounce back. So just go for it. And then the last thing I would say is that the garden, um, it gives me peace. So it, I feel peace when I'm in it. One of the reasons I love having friends over is how often they tell me that they feel peace 
when they're sitting in my garden. And this is a crazy world and there's a lot of craziness going on. And at the same time, peace, like we can make it and it's within our grasp. And there are ways um, if we connect with these other living beings that we're supposed to connect with. And so I think that's the last thing I would leave you with. I hope this presentation, if nothing else, has given you some sense or some um, inkling of that piece as well. And that is all I had planned to share. And I am um, happy to take questions now. And I think I see some of them popping up. Thank you so much, Barbara, for your presentation. Um, I just want to add something to the, the part about making mistakes. And, and it's a it's a famous quote, and it's I say that if you're not killing plants, you're not stretching yourself as a gardener. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> there really is trial and error, and once you figure it out, then you go on and um, you're successful, and you have this flourishing garden like you do, and it's just amazing. So. Um, I wanted to go through some of the questions that is, are in the chat. Someone at the very beginning had a question about the name of the LA Community Garden that you're referring to. Yes, it's Ujima Garden is at Augustus Hawkins High School. Okay. Um, as we go down, lots of questions about what kind of potting soil you use, um, what your mix is like, do you vary that between the type of native that you're planting um, and kind of like what's your cookbook recipe? Sure, so um, there's like the simple answer and the difficult answer. And again, like I worry about overcomplicating things. Um, I use four different soil mixes. So, um, but I don't wanna make it sound too complicated. First of all, I would just say use a good, quality potting soil. So that is the one place I have not figured out how to save money other than clipping coupons, which I do, but um, use a good quality potting soil. Um, some people recommend cactus and succulent soil. I haven't found that's necessary, but also I water maybe twice a month in summer. And right now I haven't watered since December. So I think there might be a trade-off between how much the soil drains versus how much you water and getting that recipe right. I just use standard potting soil for most plants. In the nursery, um, I use seed starter mix to start seeds. And then when I transplant seeds into um, small pods, actually I'll share my screen so I can show an example of this. Um, one second. Okay, so um, when I transplant them into the little pots, uh, like show, the one shown here, I use a lightweight soil mix that is one part potting soil, one part perlite, one part seed starter mix, because in little baby plants, it's easier for the roots to make their way through there. And that soil drains so well with that perlite and peat mix then that it helps prevent root rot. So that is another soil mix. Um, I propagate calicortis, as you see here on the left, that's kind of a new thing that I started a couple years ago. They take three years from sowing to bloom, so it still feels like a new thing. And um, I use what I believe is considered a standard UC Davis mix. So one part coarse sand and one part peat. Um, I'm sorry, it was coarse sand and what was the second one, peat? Peat or seed starter mix. Okay. Yeah, something fluffy. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, someone had a question about uh, root pruning and repotting to maintain them in containers if you do that. I have not done that yet. I just keep moving them to bigger containers. Um, I will see how things go as I start running out of space, um, which honestly I probably did some months ago, but I haven't. Everything looks healthy and happy. So I I think I mostly have shrubs, except for one accidental Catalina cherry. Um, that's the only like real tree tree I have in place. So they seem okay. Um, I know it's not natives, but I think plants do certain principles that line. I mentioned I have those six camellias out front. Um, I got those from the previous pomona. So those camellias, um, I mean, I've been here 15 plus years. She was here for like, I don't know, 30 years or something before then. So 
Anyway, the camellias are probably at least 20 years old. If you visit the Sconso Gardens, you know how big camellias can get, but these guys seem good in pots. So I think to some extent they just adapt as long as you're not putting in like a post live oak or something. Mm -hmm. Sort of a, a bonsai effect, um, Perhaps, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Um, uh, someone had a question about the name of the grass you planted at your mother's place. Stipopulcra or purple needle grass is the common name. Mm -hmm. um, it is the state grass of California. Of, of course, and it reseeds pretty easily where we are. <laughs> yes, yes. If it just gets that head start, it can it can make it. It can win. It just needs that little yeah. head. Yeah. Someone, um, Laura Hunter. Um, Beautiful compliment. This is such a beautiful presentation. Thank you so much, Barbara. I know many people will be inspired to follow your practice. What a fantastic example of how to bring the wild into our lives. Thank you, Laura. That's so kind. And yes. someone else, Greg, had a comment about the hummingbird sage leaf pattern. He reminds him of the uh, vibrant knot. Fibonacci pattern that often occurs in nature and in plant growth specifically. Um, I love such a fascinating comment. It's true. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was seeing a pattern of three, three leaves kind of mm. clustered together that was spiraling around. It made a very nice pattern. Yeah. Um, and let's see, some people wanted to find out about um oh just where to obtain the the different sages um tree of life nursery up in san juan capistrano is certainly um uh, a go-to nursery um it is a little bit of a drive for us down in san diego to go up that way but uh other nurseries where you can find the different sages uh are musa creek nursery in Valley Center, and then closer to the border, um, Native West also sells uh, these natives. So those are other resources for people. Um, and then everyone here is talking about how their lovely experiences with killing plants. Oh, <laughs> someone it's said, a fine balance. <laughs> someone said, if nothing's dying, you're not trying. Hmm. I, <laughs> um, I think. It's funny because it's like that balance, right? I mean, they are living beings and they should be honored and respected as such. Um, and at the same time, you know, like, I mean, I killed three desert plants and that was my learning, right? And I guess that was their gift to me with their lives. Um, I just think it's important to, yeah. yeah, kind of think about that balance and do your research where you can, um, but also, I mean, one of the great things about plants, one of my best friends, she always says, she's like, there's no end to what you can learn about plants, which means, yeah, you, you will never be able to do enough research to get everything right the first time. And that's fine, too. <laughs> yes. Um, one last question. Someone wanted to know what kind of what your sunlight situation is in your garden. So the back patio is south facing, southeast facing. Um, so full sun, pretty much full sun. And then the front porch is pretty much full shade for the same reason because it's the opposite side of the building um, so it's northwest facing um, which is why I have the camellias there I've actually tried putting natives out there um, they grow they don't flower they don't get enough sun out there and I have put in the shadiest shade lovers that you can but it is what it is but it works out because then my hummingbird or the hummingbird not my hummingbird but the hummingbird can um, raise her babies not in a restaurant okay all right. Well, um, we truly loved your presentation, Barbara. And um, does anyone else have any questions for her? All right. Well, um, again, everyone, um, just a couple of reminders. We have a Native Garden Tour coming up on April 1st and 2nd. Tickets are still for sale. You can go to our website cnpssd.org um, to find out more information about the tour and to purchase tickets and um, we also have uh, native plant week coming up in april after the tour and uh, our chapter has a lot of fun events 
that um, will be um, specific for Native Plant Week. So stay tuned. Um, look at our website and our newsletters as they come out. And um, I think that's it. So um, let's see, any other, everyone is giving you claps. So oh, thank you. Thank you everyone <laughs> for taking the time to sit and listen. It means a lot to me that you would do that and really appreciate your time and your attention <laughs> and your love for these plans. So thank you. All right. Christine, when is our next in-person meeting? <laughs> um, I will let you know. 